Our contemporary world, overwhelmed with technology and information, keeps rushing forward at a frenetic pace. And we, temporary inhabitants of this planet, race along, seldom understanding what happens around us and to us. In our documentary series, we will speak of the incredible worlds of the Bushmen, the Maasai, the Ndebili, the Suri, the Tuaregs, and the Himba. These people have a first-hand experience of civilization. Also, they are regularly in close touch with it, though often reluctantly. Yet they insist on sticking to their traditional lifestyle, as passed down from their ancestors. Give me a camel, a saddle and a tent, enough to make me happy. Our pathway to the Saharan nomads starts off in Warzazati, a city in southern Morocco, right at the foot of the Atlas mountain range. It is the gateway to the Great Desert. This is a traditional dwelling place for the Ait Atta Berba nomads. Morocco is home to some 8.5 million Berbers, which amounts to about 30% of the country's population. Only 2-3% to of these, however, maintain a nomadic lifestyle. But it is these people, loyal to their ancestral traditions, that are the key characters of this film. An ex-nomad has been so kind to agree to be our academic guide into the Berber world. His name is Ahmed Skanti. Born in a tent, he received higher education and as a postgraduate did a PhD thesis on anthropology with reference to his family's history. Nomadism is more than a lifestyle. It is rather a mode of existence, a way of using the environment for breeding cattle, namely sheep, goats and camels. My name is Fadmi Yahya, and I am the head of the Eight Isfal family. I'm 45 and I have seven children. I live here because my father used to live here. I breed cattle. We're suffering from drought. The drought has plagued this place for three years. We almost have no connection with the outside world. In the past, the kids used to study, but they don't do any more, and the teacher no longer comes. There's no doctor either, so whenever someone falls ill, I call a taxi for 20 to 30 dirhams. If I find a job, I'll move to the city, but when there's no job, it's better to stay here. We have arrived at Muhammad's tent. He spends the whole year here and knows no other lifestyle. In winter, he takes refuge at the foot of the mountain to shelter himself from the cold, and in summer, he roams across the plains. Within a year, Muhammad camps up to 20 times, looking for new pastures for his herd of 50 sheep, 100 goats, and five camels. I buy food at the markets, flour, sugar, grain, maize, butter, and forage. We often eat meat. There's no problem with it, because we have our herd. We cook vegetable and meat tagines. This is the main dish we love. <laughs> Muhammad is 30, and his wife Fatima only 20. They got married two years ago and recently had a baby girl. Ah, what a pretty little Berber you are. A Berber woman traditionally ties her baby to her back and carries it that way till it has learnt to walk. They say such practice encourages the child's growth and fosters its sense of direction. Unlike Europeans, 
the Berba women breastfeed their babies until the age of two. I have noticed that female Berbers, though Muslims, seldom cover their faces in public. This is a deeply rooted tradition and not the only idiosyncrasy of the nomads' interpretation of Islam. Tea making ranks high in nomadic life. But it is only in the 19th century that tea, initially considered an elite drink, came to the Sahara. One often says here that tea should be as bitter as death, as sweet as life, and as delightful as love. We drink tea four times a day, in the morning, at noon, in the afternoon, and at night before going to sleep. In the end, I ask Muhammad about what he values most and could not do without and what keeps him in the desert. I admire my herd. There is no nomad without a herd. My herd means everything to me. I would die without it. The nomad's belief is as simple as their lifestyle. In the 8th century, they embraced Islam, but preserved their language, mentality, and many traditions, as well as ideas of life and death. When a person dies, they erect a simple tombstone on his grave, with no inscriptions at all, and it is only the number of stones that allude to a cemetery. On our trip, we have encountered no mosque whatsoever in the Sahara, but we have often come across weird stone structures. These are graves of saints, the maraboots. The nomads pray to maraboots for protection, rain, health for their family and herd, welfare and good luck. They are addressed in case of intertribal disputes. The Berbers make their sacrifices right at the maraboots' graves. They first slaughter cattle and then share meat among all those present at the ceremony. The nomads believe that only maraboots can mend a rift between tribes at war. Only the tent you have pitched yourself will stand well. A peculiar symbol of living space for the nomads is the tent. This structure, though a very simple one, meets all the demands of nomadic life. It is portable, water-resistant, and heat-retaining. A tent is easy to remove, load upon camels or mules, and relocate. The tent is of very special importance to nomads. I remember spending time with mother and sister inside the tent. Mum would be cooking meals. Sometimes we would go to collect wood, water or food together. I can also remember playing with kids by the tent. And also when it was cold at night, come inside and lie down on our blankets to warm up. Sometimes when the wind blew hard, the tent would collapse in the middle of the night but these memories are still very sweet. To make a house, nomadic Berbers use dirty camel or goat wool. Such wool preserves natural fat, and the cloth made from it creates a microclimate inside the tent, making it easier to sustain both heat and cold. As a rule, in Berber families, it is the marriageable daughters who weave tents, and it can take them up to two years to complete one. The woman hand ready-made sheets over to men, 
who sew them together. With the nomads, it is an exclusively male job. The tent is divided into two parts by two upright poles. The larger part is for men and the guests. The smaller one is for the family. It is also a storeroom for food and a bedroom. It's the fourth day of our roaming across the Sahara, not far from the border with Algeria. And we're on our way to attend a Berba wedding. Better walk in a funeral ceremony than have a marriage of convenience. Unlike Arabs, the Berbers typically live in monogamous families. Bride and groom choose each other well in advance. It is the mother who prepares her daughter for the wedding. She kisses her feet and rubs them with henna. This rite symbolizes purification and purports to protect the girl against all evil. To give the bride's lips a plumper look, they color them with a pulverized hazelnut root, use kajal for eye makeup, and cover cheeks with a traditional pattern of ochre and saffron. While the wedding is in full swing, let me tell you about the Berber skill of tattooing. All Berbers, including men, women, and children, get tattoos, which is forbidden by the Quran. It says the part of the body covered with a tattoo will inevitably burn in hell. But even this frightening penance is no barrier to them. My spouse Anastasia has agreed to showcase the Berber patterns. They start from the forehead. Next comes the chin, neck, breast, arms, ankles and feet. There are also two parts well hidden from the eye. All in all, it makes 11 body parts. Finally, the tattoos are completed. By the way, it proved not that easy to remove them. It took a week for the drawing to fade away. Under the Berber tradition, during the wedding ceremony, the bride's foot shall not touch the ground. Next to the bride, a small boy is seated as a symbol of continuation of family. Men hail her coming by firing shots. At our wedding, they blew up poppers so as to scare evil spirits away. Often the Berbers hold many simultaneous weddings. In the past, the number of couples could amount to a hundred. We've been so lucky as to witness two Berber weddings at once. It's customary to take wedding celebrations most seriously. The celebrations take three to five days. I wondered what gifts the bride and groom are given at the wedding. The parcels prove simple enough, even modest by our standards. Families give each other sugar, dates, henna and tea. No cars, no houses, no honeymoon cruises. There are a remarkable handful of onlookers at every wedding. People take their time to come from faraway cities or oases to watch the ancient ritual. Sad as it may be, a sheep had to be sacrificed. This is an inherent part of the wedding ceremony. True, the wedding has impressed me a lot. let alone the music that keeps haunting me to this day. Okay, here I am on a freelance job as a photographer for the Nomad's wedding.
Our sojourn in Morocco coincided with an unprecedented flood, the first for over 60 years. The four-wheelers got somehow bogged down in the soaked desert. That very moment I felt especially intensely how unique and irreplaceable the camel is here. Any water would do in the desert. Water is no private property in the Sahara. No one can possess a well. I'm told that nomads invented a water clock a long time ago and called it Sad Stal. They take a bucket, collect water, then make a hole in the bottom, and the water starts dropping inside. Underneath, they put another bucket till the second bucket is full. Then comes the turn of the next tribe. You would miss being in the Sahara without riding a camel. Ah, this is a very fundamental device. Apparently, we can hardly imagine the former role camels played when they first appeared here in the Great Sahara. They were introduced thanks to the Romans, who came to today's Maghreb in the second century AD to wage the Punic Wars. It was then that the Romans, who used camels for economic purposes, brought them into the country. The camel revolutionized life in the Sahara. The nomads got a universal means of transportation that allowed them to move in all directions across the Great Sahara. People are like camels. Out of a hundred, only one is fit for riding. We visited a camel market in Guilmim. In the olden days, people used to bring camels for sale here from Mauritania, Tinduf, and Timbuktu. My name is Shian Al Bashir. I've sold camels for 30 years. Camel milk is a medicine, as is camel meat, and riding camels is a therapy, which again confirms that they only do well to man. The Lord has created no other animal that is as useful to man. As a rule, camels weigh 500 to 800 kilograms. The best age to sell them is either four to seven years of age. Camel pricing depends on a combination of three factors, weight, age, and species. The price often reaches 2,000 euros. Since the advent of cars, camels have been mostly bred for meat and as a way to maintain ancestral tradition. Nomads say, he who has tasted camel meat will host angels in the stomach for 40 days. At a certain point in time, I felt like the Saharan moonscapes would never end. And suddenly, a miracle happened. A broad green valley spread in front and sometime after lavished its cool and shade upon us. Can a country where palms grow ever disappear? The eventual destination of our trip is Tafalalt, the largest oasis in the world that gave its name to the whole valley of palm woods in the Arashidia province. It is the last big oasis before the endless Saharan plains. It is of interest to us for two main reasons. Firstly, it hosts the biggest date plantation. Secondly, it's only and solely in Tafalalt that you can see two cultures overlap, the nomads of the Sahara and the sedentary oasis inhabitants.
I need to admit to having a special place in my heart for dates since I was a child. For me, they are first and foremost a nexus to the Holy Scripture, namely the Bible illustrated by Gustave Dore, which was shown to me once I was a kid by my grandfather, Ivan Vinogradov, the Russian imperial pilot during World War I. Every time he started speaking of the Bible, I would have my plate full of dates in my hands. And now that I glance at them, they fill my heart with special affection. Our land is a land of prosperity and a land of date plantations. We welcome all those who are thirsty, hungry and tired. We use sweet dates for food and give the bitter ones to cattle. Nothing is wasted. In our land, man feels safe and immune. We are as pure as saffron. We wish well to our children and all people. In Tafilalt, one can encounter many nomads that have adopted a sedentary lifestyle. They live in clay houses, cultivate fertile land, and make use of contemporary civilization. Once, however, the balance of power between the nomads and oasis inhabitants was entirely different. Nomads prevailed, and pastoralists sought protection from them to be sheltered from other tribes' raids. But those times have irreversibly sunk into oblivion. This is the story told by Sheikh Old Bashir Numani, who we visited. The conversation we had with the Sheikh just about returned us to the old age of nomadism. Which life is better, as a nomad or in the oasis? I'm an old man and I've led a nomadic life for years. We used to move across vast territories. We had camels, tents and slaves. Life in the desert was different from what it is now. We had no ever-present wicked gadgets, which are in fact of no good at all. We were truly happy. Everyone was king of his own domain. It was just enough for us to drink milk, eat dates and camel meat. It's good for us when everything is green. Female camels bear calves and nomads enjoy a lucrative trade. Evil is brought by drought. It's drought that left all my friends with nothing but a bitter recollection of their one-time nomadic life. When all you needed to be happy was a gun, a beautiful wife and a good-looking camel. A beautiful wife, servants and slaves in your tent are enough to make you happy. Mm -hmm.